Revelation chapter number three. We're just going through the churches and want to uh, uh, pause a second on that, but we'll still look in the, the Bible. If you have your Bible, Revelation three, let's turn there and we'll read from uh, verse number seven <clears throat> and down to 13. But I want to look at uh, a specific phrase and then uh, spend a couple weeks on this church, the Philadelphia church, Revelation three. Verse number seven. Oh, yeah. oh, you got the video. Let me read this and then we'll sit down and watch it. Okay, since I've got everybody going here. Revelation three, verse number seven. Okay. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Well, let's pray. We'll bless it, and then I want to show that video. Lord, bless your word. Thank you again for it. Give me wisdom to pastor, to preach, to teach, and to be a part of your work in our hearts with the word today. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. I want you to watch this. Remember, he, he asked these guys to just sing their favorite song. And these are Bible college students. Don't you? Amen. My wife said, I'm the guy in the front right row just standing here singing. That's what she said I am. But I oh, love that. Uh, the old account was settled long ago. Well, uh, just a blessing. Brother Patrick said, I asked him to sing their favorite song. And what happened next? I'll never forget. He said, I'll never forget uh, this, that, that uh, neat moment in time. <clears throat> Revelation 3 is about the church in Philadelphia, the, this passage we just read. 
And the Philadelphian church, the word Philadelphia means brotherly love. And uh, it's believed that, that this church, if we would represent something, it would be the time of the Reformation until now. And that uh, things, there's a little strength and there's a little um, life and there's a little opening because now the door has been opened by the one that holds the key that no man can shut it. And uh, no man can open it if it's shut and, and can shut it if it's open. But I want you to see in chapter 3 a couple things, and then we're going to look at this phrase a little strength today. But it says that in, in verse number 7, the one writing, it says, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. Holy <coughs> and true. <coughs> Excuse me. If there's anything uh, that we need in this day, it's some holiness, some separateness from sin and from the world. And then what's true? Isn't that the question of the day? You hear things, you say, well, is it true? Uh, who knows if it's true? Uh, we heard this, but I don't know if it's true. Well, I got it on the Internet. It's got to be true. We're not, right? Uh, uh, the, truth is so important. And, and, and it's like, uh, I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, Independent. I would like to hear the truth from any side. And, and you, don't, you don't get it from any side. There's just all kinds of, of things that are said and, and per, uh, put out there. It don't matter. Uh, I, I don't matter who you like or who you don't like. There's a bunch of lies. There's a bunch of untruth or unknowing. And then when it comes to uh, all different areas of life, you just wonder. Let's just talk about the weatherman. Can someone say amen? I mean, is, does the weatherman ever? We don't know what's true. The only thing that I know for sure is true is the claim of the Word of God, and I believe every single page of it's true. And there are websites devoted to trying to declare how untrue the Bible is and using half-truths or straw men arguments to try to cast doubt upon this, and it's just not there. The more you inspect and the more you look, the more you see this book is true. It's valid in all areas, scientific, archaeologic, geographical, humanitarian, philosophical, this book is the only real truth that I am confident about in this world. And so he identifies himself, he that is true and hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. Uh, this key is important too because there are doors that I, I just know that if it wasn't for God opening, how would we ever get through? How would we ever um, be able to make it in life? Have you ever felt like that, that just, just you happened on to something and then you realize, God opened that door. God made it possible for us to go through that. Um, somebody was telling me that, uh, oh, uh, Sister Hecker, Christy Hecker, she hasn't been able to come for a while. And she said, Preacher, I'm coming tonight. I'm planning on it. And uh, we were talking and I said, uh, she said, I'm glad that you came to Marysville. And I said, well, I'm glad you came to Marysville. Uh, you, if someone finds our church now, it's not hard to find. You can see it from all different angles, even without a sign. Can somebody say amen? You can see. <clears throat> but if you found our church back in the old stockyard, you, God had to send you there because it just wasn't on the, the, the broad way. It was on the, the straight and narrow way off of the, the beaten path. And remember when Christy came, she said, the Lord told me to come to this church. I don't know why I'm here, but the Lord told me. And then when I came in, I thought, I'm never leaving this church. And, and uh, just how that happened, it was just, she said, I, don't, I can't tell you how to dream. I had a dream about going to your church, and that's why I came. And so uh, God opens doors and, and makes ways. And, and you say, well, why doesn't he open up every door? Well, I think that some things we need to go by faith and not just by sights and signs. I think that God shows us some things. But if God had to show you everything, and do, th then what faith is involved and what trust is there as well? And uh, God has showed me some things, but also he's required me to do some things by faith. And when I couldn't see it, I'm just still going to believe and do it. And both of those are God honoring. Um, but there's also a time, I think, for each one for growth. Uh, so in Revelation, this, this church, he identifies himself as the one having the key of David. Go Hold your place here. Go back with me to Isaiah chapter 22. I want to show you something with that thought in mind. Isaiah 22. What do you need to know to understand Revelation? All the other books of the Bible. That's what you need to know. Uh, it, takes, it takes all of them. Uh, Revelation 
or Revelation 3 refers back to Isaiah 22. Look at Isaiah chapter 22. Let's start in verse number 20. The Bible says, It shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with thy robe, strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall... Hmm, interesting, isn't it? And I will, look at this verse 23, I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity, from the vessels of cups, even to all the vessels of flagons. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed and be cut down and fall, and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off for the Lord hath spoken it. Interesting, this prophecy about Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. Eliakim in Hebrew, that word means God raises up. Hilkiah means the portion of Jehovah. And so literally, I'm going to call my servant, the one who God raises up, who have the portion of Jehovah. Doesn't that sound like Jesus? The one that God's going to raise up and then he's going to have the key and, and the Father's throne and the Father's house. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place and my Father's house are many mansions. And you start realizing that some of these New Testament verses hmm, have some Old Testament fulfillment and roots. And that's because the Holy Spirit wrote the whole Bible. And in Revelation 3, he identifies himself as the true one who has the key of David that opens and no man shuts and closes and no man can open. I think that's what we're talking about. Uh, the Lord Jesus is identifying himself and fulfillment of um, Old Testament prophecies and references so that uh, you can see how it all dovetails together. I like it that he's referred to as a nail in a sure place. Didn't they nail him to a cross? And it was a sure place where all my sin was paid for. And then um, he's fastened and be removed and cut down and fall. And the burden that was upon it shall be cut off. Jesus is referred to in Isaiah 53 as the one that was cut off from the land of the living. For the chastisement of my people was he smitten and stricken. He is our answer for our sin. And he's the answer for us to get in. He's got the key to the door. So in Revelation 3, just some of those references... Um, I wrote down Acts 15, verse 16. Would you turn there a second? Acts 15, verse 16, looking up some verses of reference to uh, uh, this thought. It says in Acts 15, 15, And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles, upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things, known unto God, are all his works from the beginning of the world. And so he opens up, this uh, key or this door to the tabernacle and the door I think that it's talking about is the entrance into the Holy of Holies. Jesus is that one who makes it possible for us to come and pray and uh, have a little strength and have um, access in to where God's help is. The Bible tells us that we labor to come into His presence and come boldly before the throne of grace to find help in time of need, Hebrews chapter 4. And so this open door, it's still now that it's open, uh, we've got to do some things to go through that door. I believe the door of salvation is open to everyone. You just got to walk on through. 
Uh, the door, uh, he is the door, and you can only come into heaven by him. But the door doesn't bring you in, it just opens to let you in. You see what I'm saying? Uh, the, you have to walk through the door uh, in order to get into the room. <clears throat> so if it's locked, you can't get through the door. Uh, but since it's open, he is the key, now anyone can. And, and then that, that phrase, look at verse number 8. I'll go back to Revelation 3, I'm sorry. If you want to turn back there, hopefully you held your spot. But um, he's true. That the key of David, this is the identification of him to this church. I know thy works. And, and again, <clears throat> none of us are saved by our works, but yet all these churches have works. That, that's what a church should be about. Uh, we should have works. We should have good works. Our salvation, that, that, that's not uh, about it, but um, there ought to be something that comes from that salvation. I know thy works. I've set before thee an open door. No man can shut. You have a little strength. We're going to look at that phrase for uh, the remainder of the time. But it says, you have kept my word and not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Um, I was reading a, a Jewish perspective on that verse, a Messianic Jewish perspective. And uh, their perspective is that all of the early Christians were still meeting in synagogues. Uh, even when they believed in Jesus, Paul went to the synagogue and reasoned out of the scriptures. And so uh, there was just a, a tough notion of accepting that Gentile could be a part of the church. Remember that conflict with an axe, wondering, some said you had to be circumcised or you couldn't be saved. And so what they were saying is the ones that would not accept that uh, Gentiles could be a part of the church, and that's what Isaiah 22 said, that the Gentiles can seek, or in Acts 15, that they're the ones saying they're the true Jews and are not. But really, when you have a belief in Jesus, your father uh, of faith is Abraham, and we're part of that family spiritually, even though I'm not Jewish by my ethnicity, I am part of God's family. And there's that recognition of, of Jew and Gentile being together as a church. And so these that are of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not. Um, that, I think that's the spiritual family that we become part of Abraham's family by faith. In Galatians chapter 2 and 3, you read about that and it, it compares Isaac as a child of, by faith, and Ishmael and Hagar as the child by the law, or by the flesh, and manufactured. You don't have to be Jewish ethnicity to be one of God's children now. Amen. You need to have faith in Jesus Christ to be one of God's children now. Amen. So <clears throat> the, the perspective from a Messianic Jew is, hey, these people are claiming that they're God's people because their ethnicity, they're going to bow and worship uh, one day along with you because the true Jew that's referred to now is by faith, not just by ethnicity. Now, what do you do with that preacher? Because the nation of Israel still is part of God's plan. In the future, it is. And we've seen, I believe, seen it form as a nation and form as uh, still a, a, uh, a place in the world. Jerusalem is a literal place. But Look at verse number 12 of Revelation 3. I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is what? New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem, Revelation tells us, is coming down from above. Now, it doesn't mean that God's done with old Jerusalem because the prophecies of Daniel refer to that city. But we're really looking for the new Jerusalem, uh, the city of gold that comes down four square and, and all the pearly gates and, and all those things. That's the city, Revelation tells us, that, that's going to come on the new earth. <clears throat> so interesting, just that, that heritage and that uh, uh, allusion to, not allusion, but uh, alluding us or referring us to those things because... I believe I'm spiritually part of God's family and faith of Abraham, even though I'm not physically 
Uh, now, I do like to save a dollar, okay? I might have some, uh, uh, some ethnicity blood in me, but uh, it's a bad, uh, I, I don't think that that is any disrespect or disregard when we talk about cultures and people in that way. But in this woke society, oh my goodness, you referred to being cheap as, as being Jewish, then, then you, you, don't, you, don't, you shouldn't have a job anymore. Or if you refer to this culture or that culture, then you're not woke and you're baloney, 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 salami. Amen. And I'm a redneck farm kid, so you can make fun of me all you want. Amen. I, bib overalls are my friends and uh, uh, from southern Ohio, which is just northern Kentucky. Amen. So uh, th these ethnic or these cultural things, just get over yourself and laugh a little. I mean, come on. Uh, uh, the, you're, you're, the offense, there's a lot more offense things that we do than what we say. But anyway, I get off that. Revelation 3. Look, I want you to look at this phrase in verse number 8. <clears throat> For thou hast a little strength. And just want to talk to you about a few things that are little in the Bible. Little. Um, little strength. Just a little strength. Look what God did with that in this passage. I've opened a door. I've got the key. And you just got a little strength. I'll keep you from the hour of temptation. And because you've kept the word of my patience just a little bit. And oftentimes we say, oh, what's a little going to do? That's not going to fix or change anything. I might as well not even try. No, a little faith, a little involvement, a little prayer. A, a li hey, every little bit helps. I'm going to say amen to that. So let me give you a few examples. First of all, go to James chapter 4. I want you to see this, this little in the Bible. James chapter 4. Presley would love this message. She's just a little girl. Amen. Uh, she, she said, Dad, I can't shoot over these people. I'm like, you're going to have to learn how if you're going to play basketball because they ain't going to stop. They ain't going to get out of your way so you can shoot. You're going to have to learn how to do it. James chapter 4. This is a little message, okay? Look at uh, verse number 14. <clears throat> the Bible says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a what? A little time. And then vanisheth away. Do any of you all think that your life has went slow? Or do you think your life has went fast? If you think it's went fast, raise your hand. Just conducting a little survey here. I think my life has gone by super fast. My goodness, where did it go? Where did it go? The time, the months, the, the years. It's just a little time. We have just a little time. And the Bible tells us to measure our days and to uh, uh, take, take inventory of them. But because it's just a little time, don't miss it. Don't let it pass without doing something that will last. Psalm 37.10 says, uh, oh, did I have, oh, I'm in Job. Let me get Psalms. Psalms 37.10. I'm going to read it to you real quick. It says, For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. Not only do the righteous, their time goes quick, the, the wicked, their time goes quick. Everyone's life is just a vapor. It's here today for a little time, and then it vanishes away. I remember playing John Madden football, and hearing the commentary go, Bam! Boom! Wow! And he's, his life is over just a couple weeks ago. His life on earth ended, and he entered into eternity. Uh, I remember he, he was bigger than life, his personality and, and uh, all those things, but everyone's life is over quick. And so uh, we've been here in church at Marysville for almost 14, going on almost 15 years. I'm like, where did that time go? I can't believe it's been... Some of you are like, feels like 35 preachers since you've been here, but no, just 15. It's, it's, it's quick. It just makes sure that we realize that our life is like a vapor. When the Holy Spirit prompts you to say something, do something, don't take it for granted that you've got more time to do that. You don't know. Just go ahead, and if you feel sense it that you ought to say, do, or send, hey, let just get it, uh, get it off that list right away because we don't know how long we have. Um, James chapter 3. Boy, this is a great little mess part of the message. <clears throat> James chapter 3, look at verse number 5. Even so the tongue is a, what's it say? 
little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. I know that we talk, we are made to talk, we've got a mouth and it's, it can go and flap and keep on going, but be careful with our tongue. Our tongue is just a little member, but boy, it can set afire a lot of things. A lot of things ought to be unsaid rather than outsaid. Just let it resonate in your mind a couple times before we go ahead and speak it and we'll probably be way better off. And isn't that something? We live in a world where not only can you say it, but you can write it and then it can't be erased or it can't be unremembered. The, just think about what is said and what is spoken and what on, on, on media and messages. And once it's sent, oh, I want to unsend it. Nope. Now it's there for everyone to share and to show and to see and to tell. Boy, it's a, it's a difficult time to live in when you make a mistake with your tongue. What is said it can be heard and reheard and retold. It used to be you said something, then it can be forgotten and, and kind of put in the pat. No, it can be re brought up, and people bring up things that they've tweeted from 10 years past. Look at this, look what you said, look what you did. The tongue, it's a little member. Oh, what fire. Go to Hebrews chapter 2. Look at this one. Hebrews chapter 2. It's a blessing about Jesus in verse number 7. <clears throat> this is a quotation, and um, it says, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, and he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Here's a thought I want to share with you. Jesus, hopefully we already know this, but he, he was God and is God and always will be God, but was made a little lower than the angels to be a man so he could suffer and die for sin. How do you kill God? You can't, but yet Jesus was God and died for us. That's the explanation of that. But what I think is important is, look, Jesus was willing to make little of himself for a really large purpose. Amen. And I tell you what, in your family and in your friendships and in your church relationships, a good dose of letting me be little for a greater purpose is a great attitude and maybe no one else will recognize it at the time they don't need to but I'm sure that if you're going to get along with friends and family you've had to let your feelings be a little smaller your ego be a little lesser so that you could stay in those family relationships and those friendships because by golly you could be the biggest one in the room and then you'll be the only one in the room you know what I'm talking about you can have it your way, and you'll only have your way, because there'll be no one else's way around. And you can live life like that. You can decide it's going to be my way or the highway, but you might find it's only your way, and you're the only one on it. <clears throat> and then you're lonely. Like the old song, you know, all the little monkeys jumping on the bed, and one fell off and bumped his head, and then they called the doctor, and the doctor said, and all of a sudden there's one little monkey left, and he's lonely. I'm lonely. I want all my monkeys back. Where'd they all go? We were fighting over the bed, and now I'm the only one there. I want to let everybody get back in. Be careful. Make sure. I'm just, just, just some, just some uh, human advice with, with anything that you're involved with. I can make a little less of myself. I can make a little more of other people's ideas and and. Um, uh, thoughts. And then if we all do that, then it gets really sweet and it gets really good because there's a giving around. Amen. And so Jesus was willing to be a little lower so that he could be crowned with suffering of death. And I should take some of that idea. I, the Bible tells us that we should die to self daily. Amen. And take up our cross and, and those illustrations of dying. But he was made a little lower. Uh, go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> Sometimes when we're 
consistently on a topic, uh, it, it just needs a little curve or change up. And we've been talking about the prophecy of these churches and, and some of the, the different things, Revelation. I thought, let's just, let's just get a little Bible in us today besides Revelation. And then we'll, we'll get back in chapter 3 next week and further talk about that church in Philadelphia. But Galatians 5, verse number 9 says this, A little leaven leaveneth what? The whole lump. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Um, with this thought, there's a couple Old Testament verses I want to look at. But leaven, you know, it, it just takes a little bit to make everything rise. It doesn't take a lot. And the illustration of leaven is sin, hypocrisy. Um, in Corinthians, when the man that was in sin, uh, was the, he, Paul told the church to put him out because of the, of the severity of his sin. And that same phrase is quoted. Don't you know a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, church? It's, you need to, uh, to remove that so the spirit can be saved. It's not a question of the spirit of the man being saved. He was a member of a church. I believe he was saved. But he was uh, taking down the whole church. And so then, then in 2 Corinthians, hey, he repented. Let that guy get back in. Bring him back in. Uh, he suffered enough. Let, now he's right. Let, let's rejoin re, uh, re, um, uh, him and, and, and go forward. But th this is true with a little leaven. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. A little folly. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 1. And boy, it, it just it doesn't seem fair. You can do 99 things right, and then the one thing you do wrong is what people remember or hold on to. Um, I feel bad for those NFL kickers. I mean, they make field goals all the time, but the one at the end of the game to tie or win the game they miss, that's the one everybody remembers. Fire them, they missed the kick. They missed the kick. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, look what it says. Dead flies... Cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. There's some wisdom for you. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. Well, he's got wisdom and honor. Yeah, and just a little folly is like the flies on the ointment. It makes it all stink. That's just not fair, preacher. Why can't, why can't we look at all the good things? I... I just know that's, that's the way life is. I drove 99 times without a wreck, but there's that one wreck everybody remembers. Uh, it's just the way life is. And so wisdom about a little, a little leaven, a little folly. Um, Proverbs chapter 24, I believe says a very similar thing. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 33 and 34. This one says, Get a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. Well, I just had a little bit, yeah, and that leads to the poverty and other things. So a little folly, a little leaven, those are things in Scripture that warns us about. Now, go to, um, while you're in Psalms, Look at Psalm 37. Oh, you're in Proverbs. You're in Proverbs. Look at Proverbs um, uh, 16, verse number 8. Proverbs 16, verse 8. This is a Baptist verse, okay? We like these Baptist verses. Look at verse 8. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. So be content with not having a lot but being righteous with it rather than having a lot and not being righteous at all better is a little just a little um, that's proverbs 16 8 look at proverbs 15 16 better is little with the fear of the lord than great treasure and trouble therewith nothing wrong with having a lot but Make sure that you don't give up what's really important to have a lot. Have great fear, have great righteousness, and that's worth way more than anything you have to give up to get the, the substance or the material 
of it. Um, <clears throat> a little, a little with righteousness. Then go to Genesis chapter 35, and I'm almost done. I want to give you this thought. It's a little more involved. Genesis chapter 35, talking about a little folly, a, a little leaven, and these different littles. Genesis 35, uh, this story, I, I won't have time to develop all of it, but um, Genesis 35, verse 16. <coughs> Excuse me, Genesis 35, 16. This is in the story of Jacob's journey to Bethel. And he had promised if he got to Bethel, he would give the Lord a tenth. And it just seems like there's all these hurdles for him to get back to Bethel. He leaves his father-in-law Laban. Laban chases him down and tries to overwhelm him. Then on his way to Bethel, he meets his brother Esau. And he's afraid Esau's going to kill him and all that story. And then... They finally get to close to Bethel, and Jacob sets up shop just a few miles outside of Bethel, and the wheels of his life fall apart. His daughter is taken advantage of, then his sons try to revenge her, um, her uh, uh, assailant and her persecutor. And uh, there's this Jerry Springer stories happen in, in Genesis around here. But in Genesis 35, they make it back to Bethel, and then look at verse 16. After they finally make it to Bethel, God takes care of them. It says, and they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a, what's it say? A little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died. Rachel was the beloved of Jacob, wasn't she? That's what Jacob worked all this extra time for. That's the mother of Joseph and Benjamin. And Jacob tried to keep her from getting overwhelmed by Esau. Rachel was his, just his trophy. His, that was his everything. And when he finally made it to Bethel, he just went a little away from Bethel. And when he went a little away from Bethel, I believe the Lord allowed what he had prized to be taken from him. That's just my commentary, my opinion. Well, preacher, I'm almost there. I got there. I'm just going to go a little off the course. I'm just going to have a little bit of sin. I'm just going to have a little bit of fun or a little bit of folly. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm pretty good. I'm close, preacher. I'm right where I need. I'm close to where I need to be. You're not dealing with a preacher. You're not dealing with a parent. You're not dealing with another person. You're dealing with God Almighty. And I think that once we know where we ought to be, there is even more responsibility and there's more culpability. You get what I'm saying? Um, it's one thing when you're learning, you don't know everything, but when you do, preaching to you Wednesday at Nooners, uh-huh, uh, you know what you ought to be doing. You know where you should be the Lord. And then, well, I'm just a little way off. Hey, I don't want to be a little way off or a little anywhere off from where God wants me to be. I want to be right where he wants me to be. I think he calls it a straight and narrow road. That means if it's narrow, I don't want to be off in the ditch. I want to be right where the road is paved because you get off and that, there's no rumble strips or there's a deep ditch. You don't have to be off very far to pull you over the edge. I want to be right where... I'm supposed to be. This story of Genesis 35 with Bethel, I, I need to, I'll preach it again. I love this story. It's just a neat Bible study. But they just went a little ways away. Remember when Lot left Sodom? I mean, the angels had to pull him out. His wife turned to a pillar of salt. You know what he said? Hey, there's just a little city over here. Can I go there? Just a little city. That's what he said in Genesis 19. He still wanted to live close to Sodom. I'm like, run from that place. You've lost all con you've lost your integrity, lost your testimony, lost your wife, lost your grandkids and all. Get out of there. No, can I just go over here? It's just a little city. It's just a little way. What are you doing? Run from that place. Get to where God wants you. Amen. Amazing what we hold on to that we shouldn't and what we let go of that we should hold on to. That's going to come up in this Revelation 3. 
It says, hold on to that crown, lest any man takes it from you. You can't hold your salvation. We've talked about that with all these different illustrations with Revelation. Your name can't be taken out of the book, but you can lose the crown. And we'll talk about that next time in this passage of the church in Philadelphia. Okay? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Lord, thank you for your word today. Just a little Bible study about that word little. And there's a little time. We just have a little time. Boy, just a little faith. I didn't even get to that one. A little faith will move a mountain. Lord, thank you for just a mustard seed size of faith, what it will do if we put it in tandem with you. God, you're so good and you're so gracious. I pray that we wouldn't take that for granted and we would not forget it. Lord, help me uh, to remember my days and remember a little folly, just a little folly. Even if you're known for wisdom and honor, it just makes everything stink. God, I pray that you help me to be mindful, be careful, and to be um, walking in, in tandem and in, with you. We love you today. Thank you for the book. And thank you for the blood. Thank you for the blessed hope that you're coming to meet us in the air one day. Pray that we would be busy about your business. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing 596. If